Hi, I'm John Fletcher. This is the midweek devotional for University United Methodist Church. So on Sunday, Reverend Alley began a new sermon series, which is about how do we know what we know about God? And I was thinking, how do I know when I need to learn something more about God? You know, I've been a Christian for a long time. And just when you think, you know, I, I, I have God down, God and I are really close, then the Holy Spirit sort of nudges me and reminds me that there's something that I don't quite know. And sometimes this comes from seeing an image of God in someone else or in scripture, or even in popular culture, that makes me a little bit uncomfortable in a good way. That, because, you know, I think the danger when I'm looking for God somewhere in scripture or in the world is that I find a mirror in which I see myself and I see, oh yeah, there's a, there's someone who's doing a good job, you know, not perfect, but doing stuff, trying his best, doing good work, praying, going to church, and a little handsome too. And so I see an image of God that flatters me, that sort of reassures me that I am good, I am simpatico with God. And I have to watch out for that because if that's the case, then I'm not really growing. And most of the time, if I'm self-satisfied about my image of God that I'm seeing, I feel like maybe I'm a little bit off. And I know I'm a little bit off sometimes when I read scripture and I see Lord Jesus say, here is an image of the kingdom of God. Here's an image of the kind of community God wants us to be. And it makes me just a little bit uncomfortable. Here's an example from Matthew chapter 20. You might know this story already. It's a story about workers. I'm reading from the message. God's kingdom, Jesus says, is like an estate manager who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. They agreed on a wage of one dollar and they went to work. Later, around nine o'clock, the manager saw some other men hanging around the town square unemployed. He went out, told them to go to work in his vineyard, and he'd play them a fair wage, and they went. He did the same thing at noon and again at three o'clock. At five o'clock, he went back and found still others standing around. He said, why are you standing around all day doing nothing? They said, because no one hired us. He told them to go to work in his vineyard. When the day's work was over, the owner of the vineyard instructed his foreman, call the workers in, pay them their wages, start with the last hired, and go on to the first. Those hired at five o'clock came up and were each given a dollar. When those who were hired first saw that, they assumed they were going to get far more, but they got the same, each of them one dollar. Taking the dollar, they groused angrily to the manager. These last workers put in only one easy hour, and you just made them equal to us, who slaved all day under a scorching sun. He replied to the one speaking for the rest, Friend, I haven't been unfair. We agreed on the wage of one dollar, didn't we? So take it and go. I decided to give to the one who came the last the same as you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Are you going to get stingy because I am generous? And Jesus wraps up by saying, here it is again, the great reversal. Many of the first ending up last and the last first. Now, when I hear that, I got to say, I feel a little uncomfortable. You know, if it were called the parable of the unfair vineyard owner, or the parable of the kind of bad boss, or the parable of the workers who worked a long time and kind of got screwed over by their boss, I would say, yeah, I totally, I totally get it, right? But instead, Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. The suggestion is that God is like the owner of the vineyard, and that we are like the workers. And that turns on its head a kind of logic that I find in myself that I've absorbed, not really from scripture, but from the world. This idea of, we could call it a meritocracy, the idea that uh, those who work the hardest succeed the most. Those who don't work the hardest don't succeed as much. And of course, you know, to a certain extent, this is 
In a way, we can see how places where this is obviously true, I worked very hard. I got a PhD and eventually a, a job as a tenured professor at LSU. That's great. And yet sometimes that idea of meritocracy can also turn a little toxic. It, it can sort of lead us to see when we see someone who perhaps hasn't made it, then we can sort of think, oh, I wonder what that person did to deserve not making it. I wonder what they failed to do. If only they maybe had worked a little harder. Maybe we could have seen them succeed. Or when we see someone successful and without knowing their, their past, maybe we would say, well, gosh, you know, I, I bet they have worked hard and earned where they are. And yet, when I look within myself, I have to recognize that, you know, of course, I, I, I worked hard to get a PhD and I worked hard to get tenure. And yet, if I really look, I recognize that I am not smarter or better or a better scholar or a better teacher than a lot of my friends and colleagues who they have the same credentials as I do, but they do not have a tenure track job. I have to recognize that there's a lot of, well, how do I say luck that goes into my being where I am. That feels bad. There are some people who really just don't like the idea of luck at all. It is an offensive sort of thought. It rubs them wrong. Yeah, it's like, you know, there's no such thing as luck. Or, you know, luck is opportunity plus preparation, right? And I can see some logic in that, certainly. And yet, I also think of there are some philosophers. They, call, they talk about a thing called moral luck. And they use this to describe, well, they say, you know, Surely we have all had those times, I know I have, when I am like driving and I make a turn and I recognize, oh my gosh, I didn't really look before I turned and I narrowly miss hitting someone or hitting something. It was just like, oh my gosh, I came right out of my blind spot, my mind wandered for just a sec and thank goodness that didn't happen. And you know, oh my gosh, how many times a week does that happen? You know, little, little accidents that could have been and did not happen, right? And that to a certain extent is luck. And moral luck comes in with the recognition that had things just been arranged just a tad bit differently, had this person in the road been a little bit further on, had I been turning just a hair faster, had I any number of things that were just kind of random happened differently than how differently my life would unfold, right? How different things would be. I might be finding myself in prison. I might be dealing with the guilt of having seriously hurt someone, even killed someone. And I think about the people who are in prison right now. Some of them, who's to say that they are not there? Some of them might made very bad choices and others of them perhaps, they're just victims of moral luck. Again, that rubs me really wrong because I kind of want to, underneath this idea, this idea of meritocracy is another idea, a sort of primitive brain idea that got, got sort of installed in there at some point in my early age. Psychologists call this the just world hypothesis. The just world hypothesis. The idea that, you know, the world is, you know, basically fair. That if you do well and do good, then you will generally succeed. And if you do badly or try to screw people over or treat people meanly, then, you know, kind of karma, the, 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 you'll, you'll get your comeuppance, right? And at some level, this stays there, even though intellectually I know, I know that this isn't really a Christian idea. Christianity doesn't have that sort of karma's idea going for it, right? That doesn't have that idea that if you are good, you will get rewarded in this life. If you are bad, you will get punished in this life. Indeed, there's lots of places in scripture where that is obviously not the case. Again, Ecclesiastes or, you know, Jesus' own disciples come up to him and say, you know, that, that, that tower fell and killed some people. What did they do wrong to deserve that punishment? And Jesus says, look, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. That seems to be a lot of what Jesus says. It's the great reversal. It's not how it works. The first will be last. The last will be first. It's not about 
what people deserve. And I can accept that on some level. It's easy for me sometimes to accept that I got where I am, not just because, or even not even mostly because I worked hard, although of course I did and do work hard, but also because of a great deal of luck. And sometimes I can call that luck grace, right? Uh, and sometimes I can just call it sort of luck. Sometimes I have to say to call it grace is like, well, I've been really blessed. And sometimes the language of blessing that is Christian can start to get contaminated by the language of that sort of just world meritocracy, the idea that we somehow deserve our blessings, earn our blessings. I mean, there's lots of ideas from the world that sort of get folded into a popular notion of Christianity. For instance, that saying, you know, God helps those who help themselves, which of course is not in the Bible. Or the really popular idea that, you know, Christianity is about, A, what happens to you at the end of life and when you, where you go afterwards, and B, where you go afterwards is a matter of how good you've been. You hear people all the time say, well, I know where I'm going because, you know, I've not been good on this life. Now, we know as Christians that intellectually, that's not the case. That's, that's not how it works. I can accept that. I can accept that, you know, I'm here because of God's blessings. I didn't earn that. By grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works that anyone should boast. And yet, and yet, if I'm not really careful, that sort of meritocracy thinking comes in and starts to sort of help me to pat myself on the back, helps me to sort of boast about my blessings rather than be grateful for my blessings. And nowhere does this sort of just world meritocracy of the world sort of come in and, and produce what I would say unchristian or ungodly attitudes than it does like in my reaction to that vineyard story, right? Where, you know, I have worked so hard. I have earned my dollar that the, the boss has given me. I've worked all day long. And you know what? I deserve more than the people who just came in. You know, I am patting myself on the back for getting this job in the Lord's vineyard. When really, God is out all day, all day long, recruiting anyone and everyone God can. If God sees a person, God is inviting them in to work with them. My resentment of that, my feeling that they are getting something they didn't deserve that I really worked hard on, which sort of parallels some other stories, right? I mean, do you remember the first time you, you heard the prodigal son story, that beautiful story of the son who's ungrateful and leaves his father and goes out and loses all of his inheritance and then comes back and the father accepts him. And then there's that part where the older brother, the one who never left the father, he has a little bit of a really understandable sort of fit. He says, you know, well, dad, what am I, chopped liver? He does not actually say that in scripture, but kind of he does. And I kind of get where that older brother is, is coming from. It's like, look, I have worked all this time. You're not throwing me this like grand party that you're throwing for your son who went away and then come back. What am I, chopped liver just like those people? What am I, chopped liver? We worked all day for you and you're giving, you're giving this out to other people? It just seems like such a weird and bad way to do business. And certainly, if God were operating in these parables by the rules of a sort of just world meritocracy, a sort of, uh, I don't know, apprentice show idea, or is God a good sort of capitalist boss, we would have to say sort of no. In fact, Henri Nouwen, the theologian who's writing about these two stories, he called God naive. He says that God is so naive as to think that there would be great rejoicing when all those who spent time in God's vineyard, whether a short time or a long time, were given the same attention. Again, God was so naive as to expect that they would all be so happy to be in God's presence that comparing themselves with each other wouldn't even occur to them. That is why God says with the bewilderment of a misunderstood lover, why should you be envious? Because I am generous. Don't you get it? 
It's not about deserve. Which reminds me of another place where I see God operating. In popular culture, in the movie Wonder Woman from 2017, I hear that message. If you've not seen that movie, well, I'm going to spoil a little bit. Hopefully you know Wonder Woman is a super-powered immortal Amazon who is invulnerable and basically, you know, just a, a, a great superhero. She grows up on this island, this paradise island, full of other Amazons. And in the movie, she learns that, in fact, the world of humanity is at war because it's World War I and that there are some people killing other people and humans are sucked and she says, you know what? I bet it is because the evil god Ares has gone out into the world of humans and is corrupting them and is causing them, brainwashing them into fighting each other. And she goes out and she joins a group of soldiers. She kind of falls in love with one American soldier and uh, she finds the avatar of Ares, the sort of henchman of Ares, and she kills that guy. And she looks out on the battlefield and sees that humans are still killing each other. And Ares himself, the bad guy, shows up and said, yeah, you know, here's the thing. I didn't do a thing. I didn't brainwash them. I don't have to. They're humans. They're bad. And then he disappears, and she's left there with her soldier guy. And the soldier guy's like saying, yeah, you, you need to help us help these people. We're, we're, we're doing a thing to try and end the war. And she's like, yeah, but, you know, my mother told me not to leave Paradise Island. She says, they don't deserve you. And she was right, that humans are just bad people. I've worked so hard, and yet they're so ungrateful. They're so wicked and evil. And the soldier says, yeah, you're right. We are. I am. But helping us, it's not about deserve. It's about what you believe. It's not about what we deserve. It's about what you believe. And eventually, Wonder Woman decides it isn't about deserve. It's about what I believe. And she says, I believe in love. Which sounds so cheesy, but trust me, at the climax of a superhero movie where, you know, go superheroes are fighting evil gods, it totally works. And that message, I think, is awfully beautiful. It's not about deserve. It's a message of grace. It's the message that I need to hear is part of who God is. In those moments where I look at are other people doing as much work as I, as I do? Are other people as deserving of God's grace as I am? It's the reminder that God's grace, I mean, the meaning of grace, is unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. I did nothing to deserve God's love. That's what unconditional love is. I did nothing to deserve God's love. I can do nothing to make God love me any less. And I don't need to do anything to make God love me as much as God does. I have to keep this in mind because, as I've said before, I believe that we become like the God we worship. If I imagine God as a good meritocratic capitalist, as a good sort of boss by the world standards, one who rewards based on what you've done and punishes based on what you've not done, then I find myself becoming a little petty, a little tight, a little resentful, always looking, comparing myself to other people, when really I need to imagine God as not about deserve. God is the vineyard owner who is happy to welcome people into God's vineyard, who is happy to give them all the same. I need to remember this because my vision of God dictates my mission, my witness to the world. I read an article today by an anthropologist whose work was studying outreach ministries of 
these churches in the Knoxville area in Tennessee. He says these are Christian churches who want to help the poor and they reach out to the poor and they, they develop these sort of mentorship relationships with people who are in need. And over the course of months, these mentorship relationships, they get really strained and often they fail. And the anthropologist, again, who is not writing from a Christian point of view, finds that the problem is not with the people who are being helped, but with the Christians who are trying to help them. Because on the one hand, the Christians are taught you need to show unconditional love to everyone like God shows to you. And yet, the anthropologist notices, when I look at what they say their relationship with God is like, they don't describe it as unconditional love. They describe it as a transaction, that we do some good work, we do the work of accepting God's gift, and then God saves us, and we continue to do work so that we stay in God's favor. So there's this kind of obligation, this transaction, that they're sort of painting God as a kind of boss who expects gratitude and needs gratitude as a condition for continued grace. And thus, they find it hard to maintain missional relationships with people in need if those people in need don't constantly give them back this sort of gratitude. Again, that really convicted me because I see a lot of myself in that, a lot of my weariness sometimes at the world, a lot of my weariness or impatience or resentment at other people I don't see as working as hard, being as grateful. And I have to remember, like Wonder Woman says, like Jesus says, it's not about deserve. That by grace, by unmerited favor, have I been saved by faith. By grace am I where I am. By grace am I talking to you. I pray that this week you find a way to remember that grace and to spread that grace to other people. Amen.